Section 4 of Ontario Public School Geography. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sarah Swart. Ontario Public School Geography by the Educational Book Company of Toronto. Section 4. Introductory. How Man Obtains Food from the Soil. Farming with Machinery. Many men, as we have seen, make their living by hunting, or fishing, or lumbering, or mining. They are few, however, when compared to the number of people who live by farming. At least three out of every five persons all over the world grow plants for food. In America, and in the greater part of Europe, a great deal of machinery is used in farm operations. Plows and harrows prepare the ground. The seed drill sows the seed evenly and without waste. The binder cuts the ripe grain and binds it into sheaves. The separator threshes out the grain from the head of the stalk, blows away the chaff, and sifts the small weed seeds from the good grain. American and European farmers grow more grain than their own families can use. The surplus is sold to the millers, who make flour out of the wheat and the rye, and meal comes out of the oats and the barley. A good deal of grain must be fed to animals on the farm. Many other crops are grown in addition to grain. Hay... Indian corn and turnips make good fodder for the cattle. Vegetables are always in demand in the big cities and are grown in large quantities. One farmer can use a great deal of ground if he has machinery with which to work. Could he till so much if he had no horses, no plows, no seed drill, no binder, and no threshing machine? Our grandfathers had none of these except the horses and the plows. They scattered the grain by hand. They cut it with cradles and bound it into sheaves with wisps of straw. They threshed the grain by beating it with big jointed sticks called flails. In those days, it took 20 men to grow as much grain as one man can grow nowadays. Even yet, there are many places in the world where men have little or no machinery to help them in their farming. The tools used by these farmers are generally of the rudest kind. Their use entails a great deal of toil for comparatively small crops. In some cases, these farmers have no animals to help with the work, and so all the farm work must be done slowly and laboriously by hand. There are many countries where there are so many people that each farmer can have only a little patch of ground. Can these farmers raise much more food than they need for themselves? Most of the white peoples of the world farm much in the same way as we do, although many of them have not so much land or so many machines. There is so little land in proportion to the population of the countries inhabited by the yellow races of Asia that each farmer can have but a small farm, and he has very little machinery. The black peoples of Africa have plenty of land, but no machinery with which to work it. The brown people of the islands in the South Seas do not need to farm their lands, for they find plenty of food growing wild in their islands. The Japanese Rice Grower The Japanese live far to the west of Canada. To reach their land, we should have to travel by train for some days to the western border of Canada and then sail in a big steamer for 10 or 12 days more. During our voyage, we should cross the Pacific Ocean, the largest ocean in the world. The Japanese are not white-skinned as we are, but yellowish-brown. As a rule, they are shorter than white men, but they are strong and active. They are kind and hospitable and very clever in many ways. Nearly nine times as many people live in the islands of Japan as in Canada, yet the whole Japanese empire is only a little over half the size of the province of Ontario. How large do you think Japanese farms are? The farmers in the southern part of Japan do not grow wheat or oats or barley as we do. Their country is much warmer than ours. The winds which blow over it from the ocean bring heavy rains. It is too hot and wet for our grains to grow well there. Perhaps some of you have seen wild rice growing in a swamp. Rice grows best in wet ground and needs hot weather to ripen it. Rice is the main grain crop of Japan. Japan is very hilly. The hillsides are covered with tiny level plots of ground, forming terraces. The plots are separated by small embankments of earth. Other fields, not much larger than our gardens, cover the plains at the foot of the hills. These small fields on hill and plain are the farms of Japan. The farmer and his wife and his children all work in the fields. They break up and level the dry ground with heavy hoes, for they have no plows or harrows. One field is set aside as a nursery for the rice. 
It is flooded with water after the grains of rice are sown in it. Soon the seeds sprout, and the nursery bed is filled with young rice plants. Then the other fields are flooded. Each worker pulls up an armful of rice plants from the nursery bed and starts to set them out in the other fields. He wades through the muddy water, stooping at every step to thrust the seedlings into the rich soil. It is very slow, tiresome work. Can you imagine planting a big wheat field in this way? After the plants are set out, the farmer has to keep the fields moist. Sometimes he has to carry buckets of water up the steep hillside. The water runs down from terrace to terrace over the whole hill. Some of it will even reach the fields on the plain. Sometimes water wheels are used. These are big wooden wheels hung over a well or reservoir. Several jars are tied at intervals around the wheel. As the wheel turns, the jars dip into the water, come up full, and then empty into a trough, which carries the water into a canal. From this canal, the water flows into channels cut between the fields. In this way, water can be turned into the fields which need it by simply cutting a hole in the embankment between the fields and the channel. Watering fields in this way is called irrigation. When at last the rice turns bright yellow, it is almost ready to cut. The rice fields look much like fields of barley. The grain stands nearly as thick and as high. The whole family work at the harvest, cutting the grain with small sharp knives. They each cut an armful of rice, tie it in a sheaf, and lay it on the ground. They work on in this way until the whole crop is cut. Then the sheaves are carried home and stored in a granary. The husk of the rice grain is not loose like the chaff of wheat or oats. It sticks tightly to the grain. The farmer has to pound it off. Sometimes this is done in a hollow mortar of wood or of stone. Sometimes the grain is flailed and sometimes trodden by oxen. After the husks are loosened from the grain, the mixture of husk and grain is tossed into the air. The wind blows the light husks away. While the heavy grain falls to the ground, think of the labor required to grow even a little rice in this way. It would be a costly food if the Japanese farmer had to pay high wages for farm labor. He is not obligated to hire anyone. However, for he himself and his family do all the work. The farms are so small that the farmer cannot grow much more rice than his own family needs. The little he can sell does not bring him much money, but his wants are few. He eats little but rice with some fish occasionally. He and his children are half naked, and his wife usually wears only a plain blue cotton dress. He makes his own shoes and hats out of rice straw. His house is just a tiny hut built of bamboo poles and thatched with grass or reeds. You see, the Japanese farmer has to work very hard indeed for a bare living. You know now the reasons for this. The African Negro, far to the southeast of our country, across the Atlantic Ocean, is the homeland of the Negroes. It is a very hot country. The sun is almost directly overhead all year round. There is never any snow or ice there. Instead of seasons like ours, in some parts of their country, they have a dry season when it rains little, and a wet season when it rains a great deal. In other parts, there are two wet and two dry seasons in the year. In the land of the Eskimos, the winter is one long night. In southern Canada, the days are much shorter in winter than they are in summer. In the land of the Negroes, the days and nights are almost of equal length throughout the whole year. Plants need heat and moisture to grow well. In our own province, they grow fastest in the warm, sunny month of June. In that month, we have frequent showers, and the earth is kept moist and warm. It is in June that the wheat and other grains shoot up so fast that you can almost see them growing. It is then that the trees add most to the length of their branches. In the country of the Negroes, there is plenty of rain, and the sunny days are long and hot. Therefore, all the plants there grow very large. In the drier parts of the country, where there is only one wet season in the year, the land is covered with grass. During the rainy season, the grass grows to a height of six, ten, or even twelve feet. After the rains are over, the hot sun soon dries the ground and withers the grass. In these parts of the country, roam large herds of antelopes and other grass-eating animals. In the regions where rains are more frequent, trees grow instead of grass. Many of the trees are enormous, towering up to two or three hundred feet into the air. Their big branches spread out high up from the ground. Their foliage is so thick that little light or sunshine can get through. Much of the land of the Negroes is covered with huge forests of these great trees. These forests are dark, silent, gloomy places. Big rope-like creepers stretch from tree to tree. And make the forest almost impassable. 
Here and there are narrow paths winding among the trees. These are the roads of the Negroes. In the forest live many strange animals. There are huge apes and monkeys, stronger than the strongest men. The biggest of them are called the gorilla and the chimpanzee. Herds of elephants roam through the forest. Great snakes, called pythons, lurk in it. These pythons sometimes grow to a length of 20 or 30 feet and are as thick as your waist. They are very strong. When they catch an animal, they twine around it and crush it to death with their powerful coils. Even more dangerous are some of the smaller snakes, which infest the forest. Many of these are so venomous that their bite means certain death. So much water falls during the rainy season that the ground cannot soak it all in. For this reason, there are many rivers running through the forest, and the low ground is all swamp and marsh. Hippopotami and crocodiles live in the rivers and the marshes. The hippopotamus is a large, ungainly animal with a huge head and a wide mouth. It lives on the grass and weeds, which grow near the water. The crocodile is much more dangerous. Imagine a huge lizard, 20 feet long, and covered with a horny, scaly skin. Its terrible mouth is armed with sharp, cruel teeth. It lies motionless in the water until some animal comes to drink. One stroke of its powerful tail, one snap of its great jaws, and down it sinks with its prey to the bottom of the river. Many Negroes are caught by crocodiles. When a river has to be forded, the Negroes try to frighten the crocodiles away by shouting and splashing as they cross. The Negroes have black skins. Their noses are flat and their lips thick. Their hair is woolly instead of being straight or curly like ours. Many of them are tall and well-built. They go about almost naked, as they do not need much clothing in their hot land. The Negroes live in the more open parts of the forest. They build their houses of wooden poles and cover them with straw or with big leaves. They do not need warm houses. They cook outside, over a fire built in the center of the village. Around the village, they build a wall of mud or a palisade of tree trunks to keep out the wild animals. The wall also helps them to defend their homes against their enemies of the neighboring villages, with whom they are often at war. Around the village is a clearing in which the Negroes grow their food. They have fields of sweet potatoes. They grow Indian corn also, and the cobs, called mealies in Africa, supply many a good meal for them. Then there is Minoy, a plant which has thick root stalks, much like those of the sweet potato. You have not tasted Minoy, but doubtless you have eaten tapioca pudding. Tapioca is made from manioc. The Negroes, however, merely mash the manioc roots, make a stiff dough, and cook it in lumps like dumplings. The most useful plant of all is the banana or plantain. The green fruit is roasted and eaten as a vegetable, and the ripe fruit serves as dessert. The leaves of this plant are so large that the Negroes use them to thatch their huts. The fiber of the leaves makes good string, and from it the Negroes weave mats and cloth. These crops are planted and cultivated by hand. Among the Negroes, the women alone do the work. They break up the ground with heavy iron hoes, keep the crops weeded, and gather them when mature. The men do not work in the fields. Occasionally they hunt in the forest or fight with hostile tribes. Iron is plentiful in their country. Long ago they learned how to smelt it with charcoal and to hammer it into useful tools. Almost every village has at least one blacksmith who makes their rough hoes and heavy spear blades. The Negro uses his spear not only as a weapon, but also as a knife or an axe. The Negroes have many useful plants and trees growing wild. There is the oil palm, which is a tall, slender tree with long, graceful leaves springing from the top of the trunk. Each oil palm bears a cluster of nuts filled with oil, which the Negroes press out. They use palm oil for cooking, for lighting, and for greasing their bodies. Another useful tree is the boabab. It bears a big gourd filled with seeds, which the natives pound into meal and use as food. The empty gourds are used for holding water, salt, meal, and such things. The Negroes live in a land of plenty. Food can be had for the gathering of it. Although there are many Negroes, there is plenty of land for all of them, much more, in fact, than they can use. In their hot, rainy country, the crops seldom fail. Life for them is very easy compared to the life of the Japanese rice grower. People seldom work harder than they must. In the hot, wet parts of the world, men do not work hard because the earth is so generous. The Negro can grow all the food he needs with no tool but a hoe. But in our land of cold winters and short summers, that can scarcely be done. We should soon be hungry if we tried it. The Negro is warm enough without any clothing. 
We should freeze to death unless we had plenty of clothes. The Negro can live in a shelter of straw or leaves. We must have warm, solidly built houses. The white peoples, who live mostly in the colder countries, have had to think and to work hard to find better ways to get food, clothing, and shelter. Therefore, they have learned how to build machines, erect great buildings, make wonderful cloth out of wool and cotton, and to do many, many other things which the Negro does not know about at all. People who, like the white races, have learned much are called civilized to distinguish them from uncivilized or barbarous people, like the African Negroes. Everybody in the world must get food, clothing, shelter, fuel, and tools in order to live. The way in which this is done is not the same in all parts of the world. It depends upon the plants which grow in any particular country, upon the animals which make their home there, and upon what useful things can be found there in the ground. It depends too upon opportunities for trade with other people. End of section four.